Hello, uh, I'm Ed Vital. I'm the chair of the Lupus Forum and an associate professor in um, Leeds in the United Kingdom. Um, welcome to our May 2022 review of the recent literature in lupus. So if you've seen these before, you'll know what we do is um, on the website, on the Lupus Forum, you can find these slide sets, either single slides or a few slide sets for the major papers. And then um, we're going to discuss a few of those today. Um, so for that, I'm joined by my fellow steering committee member, Professor Maria Dallera. Hello, Maria. Hi, Ed. It's great to be with you here today to discuss these very interesting papers. And I'm, I'm uh, pleased to be a part of this Lupus Forum. I think it's a wonderful educational opportunity. And I think we're going to have a great discussion today. Yeah, great. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. So um, I'm... For, if anyone, if you don't know, Maria is a professor of medicine in the Division of Rheumatology at the University of California in San Francisco, where it is what time now? It is um, a little after nine in the morning, so a very okay. different time zone than you, Ed. And it's 5 p.m. here. <laughs> so um, uh, actually, the first the first paper is one that you were involved in, wasn't it? It's, uh, it's one of our epidemiology yes. papers about yes. um, uh, risks of end organ damage isn't it, in lupus. Yes, I'm happy to discuss it. So this, as Ed just mentioned, this is a study that we performed using data from our Centers for Disease Control sponsored longitudinal lupus registry. So we have this longitudinal population based registry of all of lupus patients in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where I'm based at UC San Francisco. And what we're studying are various aspects of lupus, um, but in particular, we have an interest in the racial and ethnic disparities of this disease. And we've already shown in prior publications that there's a disparity in terms of incidence and prevalence of lupus with higher incidence and prevalence in patients of non-white uh, races and ethnicities. And in this paper, we looked at you know, what is the incidence of end organ manifestations, severe disease manifestations in, in the different racial and ethnic groups in our population? And we looked at end organ diseases in these five domains that you see here on the slide. And we defined multi-organ disease as greater than or equal to two of these organ systems involved. And what we found was that patients of non-white race and ethnicity, in particular Hispanic and, and Asian patients, um, had an increased incidence and earlier time to onset of severe end organ disease manifestations, particularly lupus nephritis, hematologic manifestations, um, as well as multi-organ manifestations. And I think, you know, one of the interesting aspects of um, our cohort in the San Francisco area is we have a high percentage, about 36% of our patients are of Asian ancestry. And so this gives us a unique opportunity to study this, really this understudied population in lupus. And we found that, that Asian patients, similarly Hispanic patients, have, in, have more severe disease than their white counterparts. And so this goes along again with this theme of racial and ethnic disparities in lupus, higher mortality in these populations as well. Yeah, and, and when you say in, in, in the San Francisco area, Asian patients yeah. are mostly East Asian. So. Yeah, so, the, so when we look at our subtypes, it's primarily we have Chinese, Japanese, Filipino. Those are the three um, highest subtypes. So that's a great question, Ed, right? Because we talk about Asian ancestry patients as being homogeneous, but they're not. They're quite heterogeneous. Yeah, um, and in I, fact, I, yeah. Where I work, we have more South Asian patients, so, uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Um, and actually, we have, a, we have another, um, just a little, little tidbit, we published another paper looking at, you know, time to onset of some of these manifestations as well, and trying to break it down just in our Asian group. And we found, interestingly, that Filipinos tend to have very early onset of some of these disease manifestations, and also an earlier time of diagnosis of, of lupus. And so there are, I think, some differences as well in, in when you start to break it down by actually subtype of Asian ancestry. The numbers are just small, so it's hard to do appropriate power calculations, um, but I think there's some interesting trends there and, and very important. Yeah, I was a little surprised to not to see the, the black patients coming out worse in this study actually, were you? 
Yes, and I think that's such a great observation, Ed, because as we all know, there have been a preponderance of studies showing worse outcomes and, and, um, and higher incidence and prevalence in, in African ancestry patients. I think in this particular study, it was just the numbers. We just don't have the same numbers yeah. of patients. We weren't able to show st statistical significance in patients of, of African ancestry, just because of where we are in the country, we don't have a large number of African ancestry patients. So we were able to, to study, I think, more robustly the Asian and Hispanics. I think that's the explanation. Yeah, it's a great but I, I mean, I think across a few different things, including a study we've been working on recently, it's yeah. it really looks to me like the European ancestry patients are the outlier for having milder disease, aren't they, actually? Yes, yes, yes. That's, that's I completely agree with that. Yes. Yeah. And, and do you think it's all, is this, do we know if this is a some, some kind of socioeconomic thing or is this the genetics and the biology of the disease or a bit of both or can you tell? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So I think in this particular study, we don't know the answer, but I think when you look at, you know, other studies and other work that we're doing, um, I think that it's, it's going to be a mixture of both. I think it's going to be genetic variants that lead to molecular heterogeneity and disease risk and disease manifestations, but also social determinants of health. I think it's a congruence. And actually, uh, we have people in our group that are very interested in, in studying epigenetics. So we collect DNA on our patients at different time points and looking at epigenetic modifications longitudinally in our patients and even trying to link those modifications, those changes to times of flare. And I think what's interesting is we see that some of those epigenetic changes are linked to particular genetic variants, but many are not. And so the hypothesis or the thought is that there likely are environmental influences that also play a significant role yeah. um, as well. So I think it's gonna be a mixture, but what do you think, Ed? Yeah, I agree. It's it's complex. It is complex, and um, I mean, we the study we did was about gene expression and particularly predicting response to rituximab. And we 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 conclude we actually found that if you try to identify groups of patients by gene expression, you basically we have to treat the European ancestry patients just different to all the others. There's just different clusters there than there are in all the in the other groups, at least that we had. Again, we had a limitation in terms of the mix in our center, but mm -hmm. it, it's it's just a, such an important strat. You can't really stratify lupus therapies and what you're going to do without thinking about this ancestry question. I think that's coming up on a few of the others that we're presenting today, isn't it? Absolutely, I think it's yeah. such an important uh, important point. Um, so, so a lot more work to do, right, in that area. Yeah, absolutely. Should we go on to the next one at that point then? Um, so this is Great. one of the interferon activity ones. Uh, so I think I'm going to present mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. one. So this, I really liked this paper. Um, this is by Tim Mewald's group. So Tim's a real pioneer in the world of type 1 interferons in a lupus and has published a number of really interesting studies. Um, but one of the, one of the, one of the issues that's, that's not so well worked out, I think, and I I think it's becoming increasingly interesting, is that we have, there's this general idea that you, you get interferon high and interferon low patients, and interferon high is more severe disease. Uh, I think most people are aware of that. And um, of course, this is becoming more and more important now that we block type 1 interferon therapeutically with anifrolumab. But um, it, it, it's... The biology of interferon is quite complicated because all everything, every cell can make interferon theoretically. We know there's some circulating immune cells that make it, but um, actually every single organ and every tissue is capable of producing its own interferon and the interferons can have local effects there as well. And I think that's what they're, that's kind of one of the things they're alluding to here. Um, when you look at these studies, because I've done a, quite a few of these where you're trying to correlate interferon signatures with different features, it always comes out the skin is the clearest association with interferon signature. It's, it becomes a little bit less clear with the other organs. So the first thing they did here was they looked at lupus nephritis and they actually did show, and that's what's in the table there quite clearly, that if you're high interferon, then you're more likely to have lupus nephritis. And that is particular to class three or four lupus nephritis. 
So the, the non-class three or four lupus nephritis was more in the interferon low patients. So that's one thing that's been a little bit unclear sometimes, and it's, they showed it quite clearly. But then they did a couple of other things that I and that, and that I thought made it really interesting. One is that they looked at where the interferon was coming from in the kidney, because the, there was something on this. There's there've been papers on this with these single cell RNA sex studies on on um, on lupus nephritis biopsies, looking for the interferon producing cells. It didn't didn't always show that many PDCs there, which a lot of people think is the main interferon producers. And instead, seemed to be showing that tubular epithelial cells were quite an important source of interferon. So in Tim's paper, they did this in situ hybridization um, on the biopsies to look at the interferon producing cells. And they didn't actually find that many PDCs there. And it wasn't really clear that the interferon signature was necessarily that high when there was a PDC present. So, you know, is the interferon being produced by the PDCs that have gone into the kidney or by something else, or is it just circulating? And then they did one more thing that, again, I think made it a really nice story, which is then they showed in vitro that actually interferon treatment of podocytes would induce very lupus nephritis-like changes. So the podocytes would start going into apoptosis and they'd start expressing chemokines that pull in other immune cells and things. So actually, there's this really nice story, and I've seen this replicated in other tissues, that actually there's interferon activity within the tissue that you may not always be seeing in the blood um, that you know the tissue can produce the interferon the tissue can respond to the interferon you might not see it in the blood and maybe that's something that these other therapies we use like bulimumab or, or conventional immunosuppressants aren't affecting in the same way that blocking interferon is affecting so I think it's a really you know, I, I find it a very thought provoking sort of idea that there's a whole mm -hmm. side to the lupus inflammation that we're not always seeing. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think this is a fascinating paper. And I think it's, it's so timely, I think, given how we're all trying to think about in our clinical practices, right, how to use uh, one of our newly available therapies and a frolimab, at least we have, you know, good data in non renal lupus. But when you look at a study like this, you start to think about what could be the potential benefit in lupus nephritis? And of course, we have the phase two data. And I'm not sure if you want to if you want to make a comment about yeah. So that um, phase two, it didn't meet its primary endpoint, but it was full of a lot of interesting signals, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, that suggested there was some benefit, um, and it, right. there were some interesting aspects that they had they had to dose higher as well, didn't they, to show the benefits in the in the in the nephritis study? Right. That's exactly right. Um, and so I think that this, that a paper like this begins to, again, lead some credence to the fact that, you know, interferon clearly is playing a role in the kidney. And it's interesting because it's, it sounds like, at least from the data that they've produced here and the work that you've done is that it's probably systemic type one interferon, right? That is then affecting the kidney and probably not local production of yeah. type one interferon, which I think is very interesting. And as it, you said, it's probably different tissue by tissue because we know that type one interferon, a particular um, interferon kappa, correct, is produced in the skin, for example, by keratinocytes. Yeah, and so exactly. I think perhaps each organ will be different. Do you, do you think mean, that's the case? That, that, that's what I started to think when we when we did that work is so I sort of thought, well, you know, all this time we've looked at lupus patients and we sort of see this one's got skin disease, this one's got joint disease, this one's got kidney disease, and there doesn't really seem to be enough in the blood to explain it. Um, there's a few antibody associations, but they're pretty weak. And most of the other things you look at in blood are pretty similar. And so I, I sort of think, is it really the tissues in control that are dictating these different phenotypes that we see and why, why patients present differently and why some of them just won't respond to certain classes of therapy? No matter, you know, if you if we do things like, you know, think drugs like cyclophosphamide, bulimumab, uh, B cell depletion, they're potent drugs they, they they hit their target well just some people that that doesn't work right right so, yeah maybe there's something going on elsewhere so yeah mm -hmm. fascinating one actually very one. interesting ed yeah should we go on to the next one at that point sure so uh this is another one actually about following patients for long-term outcomes isn't it yeah, so this is a paper that, that uh, I thought was also very interesting. And this is from David Eisenberg's 
group at University College London. And you know, they have this very robust longitudinal cohort they've been following for four decades. And the, the focus of this paper was trying to understand how often do these patients achieve what we call clinical remission or low disease activity. And the reason why this is relevant is because we know when patients achieve this uh, level of low disease activity, we can call it complete remission, we'll talk about the definitions, but when patients achieve that state, they do better, right? They have less damage accrual, less morbidity, less mortality, better health related quality of life. And so this is a very important goal, I think for all of us who treat lupus patients is how do we get patients into this level of low disease activity? And um, before getting into some of the data from the paper, I think the other important concept here, at least when I read this paper, was thinking about linking this to the, the paradigm of treat to target, right? So we're all familiar with treat to target in a variety of different diseases outside of rheumatology, diabetes, hypertension, um, hyperlipidemia. And then in rheumatology, I think rheumatoid arthritis was the, the, the first disease to, to really apply treat to target and it's worked extremely well. Patients have better outcomes. But in lupus, we're not quite there yet. And I think before we do treat to target lupus, we have to define what is the target going to be and is it going to be, you know, again, complete remission, low disease activity state? But this is a very important concept. And so in this paper, what the investigators did is they applied these three different definitions of remission to the cohort. And they wanted to ask, you know, how often did patients attain these? So for example, they use this definition of complete remission, which is highly stringent no disease activity, no serologic activity, no immunosuppressives, except a patient could be on the immunomodulator Plaquenil. Um, so highly stringent. And they found that 15% of patients achieved that outcome over the course of time. By the way, the median follow-up per patient was about 12 years. So we have a lot, we have very good, robust longitudinal data. Then they looked here, as you can see at this SADQ. So this, um, serologic activity, but clinical quiescence. So patients can have a positive anti-DNA, low complement, but no clinical activity and no immunosuppressive medications except for Plaquenil, 7% met that. And then the last category were patients who had um, serologic response, but could still have clinical activity and you see 15%. So I think one of the first takeaways for me was these are low percentages, right? So most patients are not achieving these endpoints. And I think that speaks to some of the yeah. unmet needs in our patients and that our needs for uh, better therapies, better getting certain therapies to patients. You know, Ed, you were just talking about how do we know which particular molecule will be effective in which patient with which disease manifestation, right? All of that is intertwined. We have to figure out the answer to those questions so we can, we can drive up these numbers of remission, I think, in our patients. Um, and you see here that 63% of patients achieved no remission, and those patients did worse. They had higher mortality, and they, and they, um, they died earlier. And then um, what I thought was interesting was the investigators went on to, to do multivariable analysis to look at what were independent predictors of complete remission. And here, interestingly, right, this links back to our first publication, White Ethnicity was a predictor of complete remission. So getting back to what we talked about in the very beginning, that these patients tend to have um, less disease morbidity than non-white populations. Um, also older age of diagnosis, absence of lupus nephritis, and absence of antiphospholipid syndrome were predictors of complete remission. Uh, so I think this is a very nice paper, again, just reviewing what do we mean by complete remission um, I will also mention, um, just for our viewers, that many of you are probably aware there are several groups internationally you know, that are working on trying to come up with precise definitions. There's the Doris group, there's an Asian Pacific group trying to come up with, with these definitions. Um, you've, I'm sure many of you have seen um, LLDAS, Lupus Low Disease Activity State, which is now being incorporated into many clinical trials. Um, going forward. So I think that as a lupus community, we're going to start seeing these endpoints built into clinical trials. And I think that the next step is going to be how do we actually apply these endpoints in our own clinical practices? 
to try to improve the outcomes of our patients. Yeah. I mean, one thing I thought about this, um, actually thinking about a couple of the papers that we're talking about today, is that like um, when you look at the things that predicted who was going to do well, they're not necessarily things you can change, um, <laughs> unfortunately. Point. And so yeah. I want Great made point. me think a little bit about the whole treats target strategy, which is, OK, I, remission is definitely good. But a lot of the people who got remission and did well, they were going to do that anyway. And how much of it can I change? Um, and if I see someone who's doing badly, is is that is this telling me that the right answer is I keep hammering away with more and more therapy to try and get them into? I you know that that part mm -hmm. I, I'm I I think it's I'm I, I'm less clear how well we can achieve it. I guess I suppose when you talk about the low remission rates, like you know, can you know how much can we modify this situation? That is such an important point. That's such an important point because many of these factors, as you said, are outside of our control. Um, I do wonder, it's interesting though, again, getting back to some of the comments, the important comments you made at the beginning about, you know, what is driving the heterogeneity in outcomes with, with various racial and ethnic groups. And if there are modifiable risk factors there that are linked to social determinants of health, you know, if we can modify those, but those are really hard to modify, right? Things like poverty level and, and, um, and exposures in terms of uh, environmental exposures where people live, those are challenging to, mm -hmm. to, to modify. But I think, I think you're right, trying to think about all these different factors and maybe focusing in on things that we can modify. But I think you make a very good point. I mean, and the other thing, I suppose, with the things that, you know, the things you can't change is at least you can say, well, I know that from day one. Because I, I, I'm often saying that when I'm in clinic and I make a new diagnosis of lupus in some groups of patients like young black women or something, I'm just automatically on high alert as soon as yeah. I make the diagnosis that I think this has got potential to go badly. I need to be really careful here. I need to watch this person closely. And maybe it, there are some people who they should just have a different treatment strategy from day one because they've got these risk factors. Uh, and we should rather than just watching it happen and trying to chase the disease, you know, maybe that's some that's the more positive take, I suppose. Yes, no, I think that's exactly right. And that's that's how we approach it in our lupus clinic as well at, at UCSF is uh, you're absolutely right. When we, when we see these negative predictors of outcomes. So, again, non-white race, ethnicity, pediatric onset lupus. Right. That's the yeah. other one that we're not talking about. But when you see that, I think that you do. Um, you do go on high alert. And I think that what happens practically is over the course of time, you're just more careful about tapering off immunosuppressives. Once you get that person into what you think is a clinical remission, we are very cautious. Um, and many of those patients require longer courses of low level immuno, immunosuppressives, at least with the, yeah. the drugs that we have now. Um, I think that, that's, a, that's a good way to look at it. Sometimes you have to remind yourself of these kinds of data, don't you? Because you're looking at the person in front of you, they don't look that sick, right. but you know that trouble may be round the corner and you have to just remind yourself, don't be fooled because they look okay today, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah, the other thing, of course, um, the just I don't know, I don't know if everyone's familiar with this term. I'd seen it before with Michelle Petrie's paper. It, you know, this mm -hmm. serologically active, clinically quiescent group. This mm -hmm. people who have their antibodies are up, but they seem okay. So actually, they did okay here, didn't they? Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. they did. Yeah, they did. They, uh, they, they, did. they didn't mm -hmm. get. They 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 did as as well as the people who were clinical remission, didn't they? So, uh, so I suppose don't just react to antibodies. I think that's exactly right. And I think the way that I look at that is, and you've done so much work in this area, Ed, but thinking about, you know, what are the contributions of anti-DNA, for example, to various manifestations? We don't really know, right? We know there's a clear link with class three, class four lupus nephritis, but we start talking about the skin or, yeah. uh, or the joints. I don't really understand um, exactly how these particular antibodies are linked to disease pathogenesis in those in those organs. And so I think that's where I have a struggle sometimes. And maybe that's why we're seeing that these patients did okay. It's, limit, it's the limitations of the biomarkers that we've got, really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That you know, these biomarkers, they can be up and actually you, you that that's not enough to tell you when. Yes. Uh -huh. This is one, well, 
one that I, I did with this is I was the first author on this with AstraZeneca. This was this is quite timely and it, it links to some of this other stuff, biomarkers, severe subgroups and things. So this is this is the interferon gene signature for the anaphrolumab study. So this is this is an interesting background to the story because we've known for ages um, since the work of people like Lars Ramblom, Peggy Crow, Tim Newells, that you get these high interferon people and these low interferon people who, uh, who are going to get milder disease. And we've got this interferon blocking drug with anaphrolumab. So of course that signature gets measured. In the phase two study with anaphrolumab, there was quite a striking effect um, that really the, the efficacy of the anaphrolumab really stood out in the interferon high patients and was quite a lot less clear in the patients who were interferon low. Although there were less of those and the effect didn't look like nothing, it was just less. So when we get to the phase three studies, we that gets reanalyzed. So interferon gene signature again at baseline, that just gets classified high or low. Um, and then the, this was a planned analysis um, of interferon gene signature and several other clinical and, bio, and um, the, the serological subgroups were all planned from, for in advance. Um, so here's the analysis for the percentage of patients who are responding um, for the interferon high and the interferon low. And the answer was that there is still a better effect of the drug in the interferon highs, but there, again, there isn't no effect on the interferon lows. So the, diff the drug was definitely better than placebo on the interferon lows in this pooled population, albeit that's a smaller group. So again, why is that because interferon so complex with all these different organ effects that we can't just classify it as a blood test that's high or low? It, it, it may be. Um, we, we don't know exactly why. Um, so um, it, the other marker on there is, of course, the serological markers, meaning have they got high double-stranded DNA, low complement? And if they had at least one of those markers, again, you've got a similar effect. And, and that will correlate with the interferon status, of, of course. So you don't need to measure an interferon gene signature to decide when to use anaphrolumab, but it do, um, it's not that clear, but it does sort of suggest something about different sorts of SLE and uh, different biological subtypes. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I spent a long time looking and thinking about these data when we were writing the paper. And I, I sort of thought, you, you, if you've got a biomarker like an interferon signature, it can stratify your response to a therapy in a few different ways. There's probably three different ways. And I thought they're probably all true here because one is the biomarker tells you the people who've definitely got active disease. I think that's one useful thing, which is that if it, we know if you see someone who's got sort of joint pain or something like that, sometimes it's quite hard to tell whether it's really active or not just by examining the patient. And, and probably if they've got biomarkers, that does time to sort of, that will sort of pick out the people who've got more active disease. And of course, they're more likely to respond to anything. Mm -hmm. um, then the second thing is, of course, it will also tell you you know, placebo response is a big issue in lupus trials, and you're, long, you're less likely to get a placebo response if you're if you've got biomarkers that are high. So that's that's sort of a second thing, isn't it? Not from you know what's going to happen over the course of the study. Are you going to flare more, or are you going to naturally improve? And then the third thing is whether it really tells you that what sometimes we call like an endotype, meaning. You've got two people who look absolutely identical in their clinical features, but under the surface, the immunology is different. And that means they need different drugs. And I sort of, when I looked at these data, I sort of thought, I think they're all true here, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a, there's a lot to learn, but, um, you know, it supports, it, it supports the idea that we may be able to stratify lupus better with some relatively simple biomarkers. Um, there's just one just another thing I was just thinking about actually just occurred to me actually from the discussion yeah. we had earlier was that um the, the ethnicity and race data was tested here now although this was a really big 
population that was pulled from the two studies to so 700 and you've got 726 patients in total here some of the groups were still a bit small but saying that broadly speaking i thought it looked pretty flat across the different ethnicities you know as in the effect was similar it didn't being of being of, of one or other sort of ancestries didn't count against you particularly so and i, that, I think that's quite important absolutely absolutely yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, so what? So one of the questions that I get now, commonly, from people now with the approval of anafrolumab is, you know, should we be looking at, you know, I guess there are some commercially available interferon signature panels. I've never used them. Yeah. Um, but I get a lot of questions about that. Should I be doing that to help as a kind of a um, a companion diagnostic? to use anafrolabam. And I think, you know, looking at these data and just hearing what you said, the answer right now is likely no, right? Because we know that even, and I'm not even sure what the validity is of some of these assays that are floating around out there. Um, because yeah. there's so many different ways of measuring the signature, right, Ed? I think uh, that's right, there are. And, and we're not sure any of whether, which is the best. And we're not sure, you know, whether, are the, are these patients who are interferon high going to do better only on anaphrolumab? You know, right. if you have a few right. drugs to choose from, does it? So I think it's it's one factor that could weigh into the balance, but there are many others as well, I think is the way I'd look at it. And I think we're still feeling our way in terms of where it belongs in the clinic. Personally, I do think interferon assays will one day have a role. Um, you know, we've, we've I, 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 I've, I've done them on my own patients as part of research studies and you do start to notice kind of associations and patterns and things but I just don't think we're quite there yet just mm -hmm. to know exactly how to when and you, when to use it probably the one time I've seen that I think is closest to this will help us is not with therapeutics really it's with your original diagnosis diagnosis yeah. and, I, and I, I kind of I, I, again it's not proven yet but I kind of think you know, if you see a new patient, you're not sure whether they've got lupus or not, you're not sure what to do with them, high, having a high interferon signature, it, it adds to my view of it, really. I think that's a, that's a really important point that it may end up being more helpful, as you said, with diagnosis rather than directing therapy, right? I think that's, that's a very interesting or, or maybe, or maybe it'll be yeah. like, you know, what we were saying earlier that when you've got somebody who you've just made the diagnosis and they don't necessarily look that bad now, but you want to know what kind of a trajectory they're going to be on and how much you need to worry about this person. Maybe that it's one of those features as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think the next one might be one of mine as well, actually. Yeah, I was lucky this. I got lots of papers yes. out. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, so this is, this is only a small case series, but it's actually, it's been um, locally in the UK, it's been this is potentially quite important to us because um, this has, we, in, in the UK, we use loads of rituximab for, for lupus management. It's, it, I know it's more than some other countries use it um, and partly that's an historic thing I think because of the high use early when it was was discovered um, so we so we've got lots of rituximab treated patients and we were we were very happy with it but then we started to realize we had problems which is that a lot of our worst patients the one you've had is the ones you've had hospital admissions uh, intensive care therapy and things they've had rituximab and it's turned things around for them um, but some of those most severe patients, when they get they get cycles, which often we're giving at flexible intervals, um, some people they respond for a few years with one cycle of rituximab. So it's quite a long time before you give it again. And some of these people, when you come to repeat cycles, it stops working. Um, and uh, they you can when the, when it stops working, they start getting severe infusion. I mean, like much worse than the normal infusion reactions they can't finish the infusion and they're not depleting these cells so we and and we tested some of them and they've got anti-rituximab antibodies so the real dilemma with these people is that um often it just seems to happen that the people who get that problem are the ones who had really bad lupus and failed quite a lot of stuff and they really need rituximab um, in fact we tried switching them to other therapies and it just didn't work the same so as 
many people know rituximab is just one of the class now that there's a whole load of anti-CD20 monoclonals that are mostly coming through from the hematological malignancy world but obinutuzumab is the one that looks most promising so it, it's mm -hmm. it's it's a humanized molecule so it probably doesn't have the immunogenicity for rituximab either and it also it has some alterations in how it works so that it actually is more potent at b-cell killing anyway mm -hmm. um so it can directly kill the b-cells it doesn't need adcc and other cells to get involved um so uh we so basically what we did was we managed to obtain some obinutuzumab for some of these patients who were the secondary non-responders to Ritux. and we were and because we knew that they'd responded so well to B-cell depletion before, we expected this is going to be the perfect drug for them. And they did respond really well. So there were nine of them. This is all the BILAG centers who tried this in a few people. We put all our cases together. Um, and uh, essentially, there were, of the nine patients, there was one that didn't respond. He was a patient with renal disease who had to have cyclophosphamide quite early. I don't know if things had gone on for longer if you wouldn't have done better. There was one who responded pretty well, but still needed a renal transplant, which I, actually I think she was going to need a renal transplant anyway. It's just actually getting her well enough to have it. And all the others just super good responses did really, really well. So um, that's may, you know, that's for, for, for here in the UK where we use lots of rituximab and we've got I think about 14% of our Ritux patients end up in this situation. Um, we're now beginning to prescribe a venue to them all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think this is this is incredibly interesting and Ed you published over the years you know on uh, rituximab and lupus and looking and I think um, I've learned a lot you know from you and your papers and it's interesting because um, I get, you know, one question I have for you is just in terms of your practice, are you using rituximab across the board for various manifestations of lupus, or are you focused more on the organ threatening manifestations? Yeah, really good question. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's got, I, I find it's got its, its most valuable role in these, in these quite severe patients with these multiple organ disease. Um, I use it a lot in my arthritis patients. The group who I'm a lot less sure about is the patients with skin disease, um, where I've seen much stranger responses. I think some of the skin disease patients, particularly the patients who have multiple organs involved and maybe some ACLE as part of that, the skin usually gets better. But the patients who have other things, you know, maybe more isolated skin disease, discoid lesions, some of the subacute lesions, haven't always responded very well. And some of them have actually got worse after rituximab. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's, you, and that immediately makes me think of, okay, and as we were saying earlier, anaphrolimab seems great in skin disease. So mm -hmm. I can sort of start to see a kind of, that's one group where you might separate the, the classes of therapy that you might, you might want to use, I, I guess. We'd have to mm -hmm. see more experience in the clinic to know that for sure. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, and what's next? Oh, I think you were going to talk through this one, weren't you? Oh, yes. Okay, great. Yeah, so this is also another, um, in, I think, you know, interesting paper um, that focuses on the effect of belimumab on decreasing or organ damage in lupus. And so the goal of this paper was to perform a comprehensive literature review, uh, trying to understand again, how belimumab impacts organ damage. And so um, what the investigators did is looked at the, the, the phase three trials of belimumab and you see them listed here. Phase two, the open label extension, observational data, um, uh, as well as some real world data and this propensity score match study that Marie Urowitz did as well in the Toronto lupus cohort. So looking at all these different pieces of data, putting them together, and trying to understand what belimumab is doing to organ damage. And I think just taking one step back, we've talked already about the importance of trying to achieve clinical remission to decrease the accrual of organ damage. So this is an important goal that we all have. 
we have this molecule bulimumab that was first approved in March of 2011 for non-renal and then was more recently approved, as you know, for lupus nephritis. And so the thought is, you know, what evidence do we have that we could actually modify disease progression and organ damage with this molecule? And I think the, the take home message from this preponderance of data in this literature review was that there are robust lines of evidence that bulimumab does decrease organ damage. I think one key thing to remember is that when you, when you think about how do we assess progression of organ damage, you need long-term follow-up, right? So a typical phase three trial with the 52-week endpoint, we're not gonna be able to show a specific decrease in, in damage, right? Because it takes time when we think about how we measure damage with the slick damage index, which is our validated tool, it takes time, it takes years to have to be able to show a change in progression of damage. Um, but what we can do in these shorter term trials is look for um, other kind of predictors of damage. So for example, uncontrolled disease activity, we know that that will lead to increased damage. We know that certain medications, in particular glucocorticoids will lead to damage. We know that flares will lead to damage. And so in the shorter term trials, we can look at does bulimumab impact those shorter term endpoints, those drivers of damage. And sure enough, we did see that um, in, in these trials. And so I think that just uh, again, this look at a variety of different data sources, which I think suggests to us that bulimumab does have an effect in decreasing organ damage. And I think that this is very helpful for us as we think about, you know, how we are using bulimumab in our clinical practice. And one thing that I've been thinking about um, just over the course of time is something like bulimumab may end up being a, a very good agent to use as a maintenance therapy, right? And we saw that, for example, um, in the recent Bliss LN trial, the lupus nephritis phase three, which led to approval of bulimumab for for lupus nephritis, we saw that at the two-year endpoint, there was decreased um, progression of decline in EGFR, for example, that we're starting to see modification of these longer-term endpoints. And so perhaps this agent might not be as potent early on to stop disease activity, but it may be very helpful in the long-term as a maintenance agent to prevent ongoing disease progression and disease damage. But of course we have to figure these things out in time. And this always comes back to a question that I constantly think about, which is how do we, you know, not only how do we decide which particular therapy to use in which patient, but how do we sequence our therapies? And maybe we have to be using combination of therapies. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, you know, uh, several papers now and studies looking at the combination of, for instance, we talked about rituximab, rituximab plus bulimumab. Um, you know, how can we use our therapies in a, in a very rational way supported by evidence? Some may be helpful in the beginning of disease initiation, some more for the long term. We also know bulimumab has an incredibly good safety profile. And so I think that the notion of using it for a longer period of time to prevent damage, I think makes sense because the safety profile is also very good. But of course, everything that I'm saying is, it still has to be supported by data before it's, um, you know, adopted by the community, but I think that we're starting to gather those data, don't you think, Ed, with these types yeah. of studies? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it just shows, doesn't it? One thing I really thought here is look how much data they have, they it need it takes yeah. to show the effects, isn't it? It's it, yeah. it's it's difficult, and that's the nice thing of a drug about a drug like bulimumab has been around for so long is they've got it all. We've got so many different studies, longer term follow up, and real world studies, haven't they? Um, and yeah, I, the other thing, like you, like you were saying, is one of the other difficult things is that, um, yeah, when we talk, when we in rheumatoid arthritis studies, when we talk about damage, we mean that the the synovitis causes the bone to get eroded, but in lupus, it's 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 more difficult, isn't it? Because it could be osteoporosis, which might yeah. be more to do with steroids that you had to take, exactly. rather, or, or or it could be a cataract, or, or you know, it doesn't. It's not necessarily just lupus induced exactly. scarring is it exactly. it's, it's much more i guess maybe that's one of the other reasons why it's so difficult to um to show these effects and the other thing i thought mm -hmm. is i i was thinking is damage always the most important thing 
in the long term for patients? Because there are some people who don't get damage and are they just fine? Or is it still not okay? You know, is it just, oh, you don't have any damage. Everything's fine for you. It, I mean, maybe not. I it agree not with feel you. I think, yeah, I think that's such, that is such a great point. And I think that gets to kind of this disconnect. I think when we see in our real world patients, when you think about, you know, what are so many of our patients impacted by fatigue, right? Cognitive dis dysfunction, yeah. just not feeling well. How do we quantify that, right? And, yeah. and I think you're absolutely right, Ed. Those people, you know, how do we impact quality of life in those particular patients? And as you just said, they're not doing okay, right? And yet we're not, we're not measuring damage in them. We're not, right? I mean, there um, might I even be people who've accumulated something we call damage, but they, they're actually feeling better than some of the people who, who don't have, I, I don't know. I mean, I think yeah. for, for the yeah. renal patients, I think this is really mm -hmm. crucial, isn't it? Um, I think that was the one, when I was looking at this before, I thought the, the it, because in, in renal nephritis, in lupus nephritis studies, yeah. we just look, for, um, and our end point is so much based on just proteinuria. Proteinuria is not what we're trying to prevent, is it? Renal failure is what we're trying to prevent. So it's it, it's Correct. crucial, but um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a just, very important point, yep, that you're making. Yeah, that between different patients, the importance of damage mm -hmm. maybe. The other thing I just remembered was that I was doing the last one of these podcasts with Laurent Arnaud from Strasbourg, mm -hmm. who, and who, he's a member of the Slick group who created the Slick Damage Index, and he was describing how they're currently updating the index, I think. Yes, they are. That's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. And I'm curious to see. So I'm not. A, I'm not personally involved in that effort. But I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm not either. But um, they were taking it really back to the beginning of you know going back to the original domains of what matters to patients and physicians. And so maybe they're addressing some of these questions. And I think one of the other things that he was saying was that. Um, in some ways, the damage index we use now is quite a blunt tool because yeah. one point can be a, yeah. a, or two points can be a really big, you know, it can be a stroke or, or kidney failure or something. So I think they were trying to make it slightly more, you know, shades of grey. Yes, yeah. yes. That's really good. So we'll look forward to seeing that. Yeah, that's, that's great. I think there'll be a few papers coming out too with that. OK, what do we have next? Great. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. So this one, I, I looked at this one. So this is an in, this is another new therapy. So one of the ones in the earlier phase of development where we have phase two data only so far. This is a verdamide. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's and again, it's you know what we were saying, like different classes of therapy that do different things and may suit different people. And I like it when you just see a new therapy that works mm -hmm. in some other way that I hadn't thought of. So this, um, this works on these two transcription factors, which are called Icarus and Aeolos. And these, um, these are, so basically these are transcription factors that induce the, the expression of lots of genes that are related to the immune system, particularly lymphocyte differentiation and some cytokines. Mm -hmm. And they were identified from genetic studies. So there's some, there are some uh, polymorphisms in this genes that are associated with susceptibility to lupus. So that's how we knew that was a good target. So abertamide is a drug that works on these um, transcription factors. And it's the phase two studies published and it shows um, phase two level efficacy data. And this paper here was trying to see what it does, um, which I think was pretty important because um, it does so many potential things that trying to work out which ones were interesting to um to what were important and which, which it did mainly that led to response so i think some of, so i think one of the other one of the things they showed is that you get some reduction in some of the things we know quite well that we've already talked about today like interferon signature goes down and b cell numbers go down you also got some improvements in things in the immune system you might think are good, like IL-2, IL-10, regulatory T cells. So there's a kind of a, a, a rebalancing in a way going on on this therapy. Um, and that's that, that there, were, there were a few things that didn't change that slightly surprised me, like that, because um, uh, it's supposed to block 
lymphocyte differentiation and B cell activity. And you know, normally if B cells are very active, you get lots and lots of plasma blasts being produced um, that are the, gonna go on to become the autoantibody cells. So they didn't change, which surprised me a little bit. Mm -hmm. Obviously the drug, the drug does work, but it do, it, it's, yes, it's, it, it's reducing B cell numbers, interferon levels, and increasing some regulatory effects. So maybe it, 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 it's nice to think that this will do something again that's complementary to the therapies we already have, I suppose. That's the mm -hmm. that was... mm -hmm. I agree. I think this is a very interesting molecule. And again, um, uh, a cerebron ligand similar to right thalidomide and lenalidomide, which many of us use for our refractory cutaneous patients. But, um, and I think, you know, one of the issues, of course, is that it, it, it will likely have a similar toxicity profile um, how, in terms of thrombosis and, of course, teratogenicity. But that being said, I agree. I think that um, there are kind of broad sweeping immunologic effects that we know are important in lupus. And I think that that's very intriguing about this particular uh, molecule. Um, I mean, so I the thalidomide comparison is good because that, you know, that I, in a way, I think that can be such a wonderful drug, but it's also, I always, I find it quite a frustrating drug to use. It's, um, almost, it's so challenging for patients in terms of the regulatory requirements, right? Yeah. Yes, and absolutely. Also, and I've given it to some of my worst skin patients and they've, they've done really, really well, but then they've always had to come off it at some point because of toxicity, particularly neurotoxicity quite often, I think. so. Yes, peripheral neuropathies, absolutely, thrombosis. So you're absolutely right. And lenalidomide has a better toxicity profile, so we try to move to that first, but often often our uh, insurance companies will, won't approve lenalidomide first. We have to go through thalidomide, so you're absolutely right. And I think yeah. and in this particular, I think in this phase two, I'm trying to remember, I think that all the patients were given um, some sort of prophylaxis with low dose aspirin. I can't remember, um, but I think that there was some sort of mitigation for thrombosis in this particular trial, um, say, which yeah. makes sense. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. So um, the, yeah, it's very promising phase two data. It's always nice to see a new drug that might have some unique properties and we, we look forward to it going into phase, phase three. It can always be unpredictable, the transition from, mm phase two to phase three, right? It's been one that's of right. our recurring stories. So I think that's all we have time for today. But, um, you know, thank you, Maria, for joining me. It's been a really interesting discussion. Well, thank you, Ed. I think this is a, a fascinating discussion and it's always a pleasure to uh, be with you here. And I think, um, I think I, I've learned a lot and I look forward to future discussions. Yeah, me too. So um, for, for, for the listeners, as just to remind you again, you can, get the, you can get the full slide summaries of these papers. So you can, the, not just these individual slides, but these, these papers, we did a, an extended slide set. So you can download those PowerPoints from uh, lupus-forum.com. And if you register on the site, you'll get notifications when we upload new publications these podcasts are going to be regular. We also do podcasts after the major conferences and there'll be other things to follow called courses, conference, Congress materials. So do take a look at it. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks everybody.